The title of this message today is, You Hate Your Wife, You Hate Your Husband. You hate your wife, you hate your husband. Now you might be saying, Ty, I only have one or I only have the other. I only have a wife or I only have a husband. Well, according to the Bible, (laughs) you actually have a wife and you have a husband. Now, we're going to go through the scriptures on what this means. But it's, it's, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's the same thing. There is a love that you should have for God. Last weekend, many of the members of the body went to the send to speak against, to cry out against what has happened to these people who are false prophets. To actually witness to those who are fainting in the streets, those who are going to die spiritually because they don't know better. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. And so people don't understand why they're stumbling. People don't have knowledge as to why they're dying. People don't have knowledge as to why they're spiritually incapable. And so they'll go to an event like the Send, and you may be on this channel and you may say, oh, that that event, that's very bad, that's very bad. But I'm going to show you why today you may already be transgressing in the same transgression that those who were going to the Send were transgressing in. In fact, when Malachi brings this up to the people of Israel and Jerusalem and Judah, He brings this up specifically saying that they're asking him the question, how have we done this? How have we actually done this? We don't hate our wife. We don't hate our husband. I don't hate God. I don't hate the Lord. I love the Lord. Right? Isn't that what the people at the send were saying? We love God. Right? Todd White, he's warning people. He's warning people. He's telling them, get out of sin. And this video series that the Lord is having us come out with, we're going to show you how the people can say that and then do something completely different. How people say that and then do something completely different. It's as if to say that a man were to go out somewhere to a store or to some place, and while he's there, he is looking upon another woman even though he's already married. And the woman says to him, oh, but aren't you married? And he says, yes, I am married. And then proceeds to move forward in flirting or flattering this young lady. The disregard of covenant that is inside of those things. Yes, I'm married, but I'm still going to do this. Yes, I'm married, he says, she says. Oh, I'm married. That sentence has to be weighty. That sentence has to be matched with deeds. That sentence has to be matched. It has to be brought to. It has to be equal with the way that you depart. If you name the name of Christ, you're saying, I'm married to God. And if you name his name, you have to do what? Depart from iniquity. You have to depart from the perpetuation of sin and the becoming of sin. There has to be a departure. And when there's no departure, it then starts to become something else. You actually have to get married to something else.
You have to get married to something else if you're not going to be married to God. See, the devil's trick is not to just get you to divorce God. There's some people that have fallen for that, but there's a lot of people who say, I will not do that. There's, there are people that have said, you know what? Something, something happened in their life and they, they said, you know what? If, that, if, that, if God did this and they didn't read the scriptures, they didn't understand why things happen. They didn't understand that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. They didn't understand that it may not even be the Lord, but it may be the Lord. They didn't understand that if you were to go down to the depths of who God is in, in, within who he is, that he is good. That the reason why we have a word good is because God created things and said, it is good. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. So when you give somebody a meal or when you help somebody in some way, or when you eat, uh, eat some food and you're now enjoying that food, isn't that food good because God made it? What kind of pride does a person have to have to separate the gift from the giver and say, oh, this food is here? Why does the Lord allow people to do that? Because the Bible says that the gift and the call of God are without repentance. Even when people don't want to acknowledge God, he's still faithful. The Bible says he cannot deny himself. God's not an unfaithful husband. God's not an unfaithful husband. So in regards to marriage, There is an understanding. There has to be an understanding when it comes to marriage. Because when people get married to other people, they get married with expectations. This is nature. This is natural. In fact, there's whole prides of lions fighting with one another. There's males fighting other males in a pride. Because somebody taught them that? Or because they understand that the male who is the alpha, the male male who is the most, is the one who is is the most capable, strong, that he is the one who's going to have the lioness. There's something there built into nature that says, if I want this lioness, if I want this lioness, this is what the lion that's, that's trying to fight against the, the alpha, the male. He's saying, I've got to take down this male. And so the devil's tactic, he walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour because he he wants to get the allegiance of the one who's married to the alpha lion, the one who's married to the lion of Judah. So what does he have to do? He has to look like a lion. He has to look like something. He has to parade around like an angel of light. He has to look like Another Jesus, he has to portray himself a certain way because other than that, if he just comes looking like a whole different animal, that's not natural. That doesn't feel as good. That doesn't feel as attractive. And so I'm not saying that some don't fall for that because the Bible says that there are some that have they've gone after strange flesh. I believe that there are people who will not even... Not even consider that. And that's what people think we're saying when we, when we went to the sin. They think we're, we're talking about people who just, they have just completely another animal. You see, the difficult part about what it is that we had to do is what Jesus says in Revelation chapter 2. Let's turn there. 
The difficult part about what needs to be done is that there needs to be discernment, is that there needs to be an understanding of how did they get there? How did the people from the sand get there? Were they always there? They just start out like that? And why are there Bible scriptures? Why are there Bible verses that read, because you've made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. When, when Jesus is, is saying his message to the church of Sardis, he says, there are some in you that have not defiled their garments yet. That have not yet defiled their garments. So obviously there's a profaning. There's a starting point and then there's an ending point. There's the beginning and there's the end. The Bible says, he that endures till the end, shall, the same shall be saved. So how did you start out? Because you see, that is the way of the strange woman. Starts you out. Starts you out. And then there is something that happens that causes you to hate your wife and then hate your husband. You see, the trick is, it's not easy for the devil to say to you, hate your husband. Because if the devil comes up to you and says, why don't you hate your husband? Then you'll understand the trick and you'll say, no, no, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to do that. I know this is Satan. But if he comes to you and says, why don't you just disregard your wife? And through you disregarding your wife, you disregard your husband. I'm not talking about your, your physical wife or your physical husband. I pray you didn't come here for that. He wants you to forsake your wife. If you can forsake your wife, then without you even knowing it, by the end of you forsaking your wife and embracing the bosom of another woman, her end, the end of that woman is what? Destruction, death. So the tactic, the device of the enemy is how do I get you to hate your wife? How do I get you to hate your wife? Because if I can get you to hate your wife, I can get you to hate your husband. You hate your wife? You hate your husband. Wait, what? How do I hate my wife? If you don't know how you would hate your wife, then you probably already hate your husband. And you don't know why. We talked about this before. Can God be himself in front of you? Can God be himself in front of you? If the Lord hates something, is it going to be very difficult for him to break the news to you? Like if the Lord were to be next to somebody who's saying, oh Lord, I love you. I give you my life. I give you all that I am. And the Lord says to you, you cannot accept the persons of the wicked. Lord, no. No. That's not good. You're not talking about love, God. I'm supposed to love everyone. No, the Bible says love must be without dissimulation. Hating what is evil and cleaving to what is good. The Bible says that I, God, I hated the workers of iniquity. David said, I hated them with a perfect hatred. Do you not have hate? Where's your hate? Well, Lord, but I was told all my life, I'm supposed to love. I'm supposed to love. And the Lord's saying, but that's not what my word says. That's not what your wife is telling you. But you're saying, but Lord, I don't understand. The trick is to get you to not agree and deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. That's the trick. 
Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy what? Works. I know your works. I know what you're doing. The Bible says even a child is known by their doings. And that's the thing. If, you, if you're going to watch this, this video series that we're shortly going to come out with here, Lord willing, we're working very hard to put this together so that it's very clear for you to understand. But if you'd understand that the Bible says even a child is known by their doings and everybody wants to talk about how God knows your heart, but the judgments that are in the book of Malachi and in other places and here in the book of Revelation are about the fact that you didn't lay it to heart. And if you just read Jesus saying, I know your works and your labors and your patience and how you cannot bear them that are evil. That's, those things are virtuous. Those things are virtuous. Those things are good. But if you don't understand what Jesus is, Jesus is about to say, you will pass over this as if Jesus is not actually telling you to seek into this matter and actually see where else this is found in the Bible. The Bible says a matter is established by witness of two or three. Jesus is going to say something to you right now and everything he's going to say to you in Revelation 2 and 3 in his, in his words to the churches are going to be completely proven by what the Bible says already. If Jesus is telling you they that have the doctrine of Jezebel, the doctrine of Balaam, you probably want to find out what those things are so that you don't actually transgress rather than reading it and saying, that's not me. That's not me. It's definitely not me. And then here's what most people do. They go and look it up on Google. And then what they do is they let Google or someone who wrote a blog post teach them about what the error of Balaam is. And that's part of the reason why when, when we went to the sin and we're preaching, we're, we're, we're singing this song. The time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine. They're not going to endure it. So what will they do? Well, it's, 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 at the, it's at the edge of your fingers, right? Just search it up. What is the error of Balaam? Click. Oh, I won't do that. Okay. You're probably already doing it. The fact that you did that shows me that you're probably already doing it. Where's your endurance? Where is your capacity to say, if the Lord doesn't teach me, then I, then I don't learn it? Where's your ability to become like a child again and to say, Lord, if you don't teach us, if you don't show us, if you don't show me the way, then I'm not, I don't know it. I had to get to that place in my life. The Lord was showing me this, this eight-year-old. The Lord had to use YouTube because I wasn't reading the Bible the way I shouldn't have. Well, the way I should have. I don't believe the Lord had to use those things. He could have used biblical shadows, but I was, none, I was not wise to those things. So the Lord is telling me, go and watch this YouTube channel, which I don't suggest to anybody to do because the Bible says that this is a very dangerous thing. You can get a lot of the green things in your life eaten up by the canker worm and the, and the locust and all those people that are lying in wait to take away the things that God has put in your life by just going and watching a bunch of YouTube videos on a subject. But when the Lord leads... He will let you see something, just like he let Ezekiel see something. And the Lord said to me in that time in my life, because he knew the only thing that I could possibly perceive was music. I was the, the creative pastor of that church. And I just, I knew music. The Lord was like, I want you to study this, this young man. He's eight years old and he has perfect pitch. He has perfect pitch. His dad would sit there on the piano and he would say, here's, 
What is this chord? And he would do this very complicated chord going all the way from the bottom of the piano all the way to the top. And his son would be turned around and he would say, he would say, that's a B minor, add nine, diminish seven over. Th-. He would just start saying things. And I would say like, how does he know that? And he would say to him, his name was Dylan. He said, Dylan, can you actually, can you actually sing all of the notes I just, I just played? And he would sing all the way down from the bottom of every single note that his father just played. And he would play every single note perfectly with his voice. And then his dad would say, his dad would just follow him while he was singing it. So you would know that he got every single note right. Every single note. He has perfect pitch. And the Lord said to me, that's how I want the end time church. And he called it natively fluent. And he said, every child, this is what he says on on this YouTube channel. Again, this is vanity for some, but the Lord can use something vain to teach. He says, every child is born with musical ability. Now you'd say, that's not true. I don't have a musical bone in my body. Maybe you're saying that. That's not true. You do. Every child, I do believe this is born with musical ability. He said, the biggest problem is that what you don't harness, you will not reap from. He said, so I started my child young. When he was in the womb, I was playing certain songs that were not your four chord regular worship songs. I was playing complicated pieces of music to my child while they were in the womb. And when my son came out, I made these DVDs. I made them myself. And I put colors to notes. And I would play them while my son was sleeping. My son would wake up in the middle of the night and he would see an orange screen with a D and a small M. And it would say over and over, D minor. D minor, and he would go to sleep. That's D minor. D minor, that's D minor. Wakes up the next morning, B minor, B minor. That's B minor, it's a shade of purple. There's actually people who, this is a very rare thing, but there are people who when they hear music, they can see colors. That's what this father was doing. He was taking a God-given thing and he was helping this child to be natively fluent so that by the time this child was eight years old, he didn't need someone to teach him music. But he was natively, natively, completely by his own, which is actually his father's help. Able to understand it. He said people that are not musical, their actual brain has closed that window. And he said, he, he, he challenged people. I watched him run challenges with people who, were, who had their PhD in music, saying that they had what's called relative pitch when, there's, when his son had perfect pitch. And they would say, there's no such thing as perfect pitch. There's only such thing as relative pitch. And he said, well, then come on YouTube and challenge me. He says, because I know how to take someone's relative pitch and absolutely destroy what they think is perfect pitch. My son has perfect pitch. If he hears a note, he knows what note that is. A doctor was on on a call with him and he looked at this doctor and he says to this doctor, the doctor said to him, there's no way. There's There's only something called relative pitch. That's what you taught your son. He says, okay. And he gives him a test right over the phone. He says, what note is this? And, 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 and he said, well, he says, you have relative pitch, correct? He says, yes, I do. He says, well, then what note is this? He's trying to work it out. Couldn't work it out. What chord is this? Couldn't work it out. My son can do this. He's eight years old. You have a PhD. I don't know if that's exactly the scenario, but, it, but it's very, he did have this call with this man. So what I'm saying to you is, The Lord desires, the Bible says, the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth 
You don't even need a man to teach you. We have children lining up for music lessons and we have people lining up in churches for for biblical lessons. And Jesus said, unless you become like one of these children. And that's what I felt like the Lord said to me in that moment when I was watching those videos, the Lord said, okay, enough with these videos. You can put them away because now I have a point to say to you. And I was trying to discern, Lord, what are you trying to say? Am Am I supposed to start learning how to become pitch perfect in music. And the Lord said, no, this has nothing to do with music, son. This has to do with all the bad doctrine, all the terrible things that you've been taught by men. And I want you to forget it all. Remember those two years of Bible school that you had, son? I said, yes, Lord. He said, forget it. Get rid of the books. Don't even look back at them. And I'm looking at these things. I'm thinking, I paid for this. I remember holding my diploma. I'm holding it and I'm I'm thinking, what is this? What is this? You did two years in, in Babylon. Trash. Oh, you might need that. One day, one day you might need a job. You might need that diploma. Do you have a diploma? No. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. The temptation to say, well, I mean, I did go to Bible school and it is credited so I could actually transfer to a secular school if I really wanted to get my credits up. And the mind, the mind starts thinking, well, I mean, I might need this certificate. But I had to realize that that certificate said you went to the strange woman's school. You like that? You went to the strange woman's school. And I had to say, forget everything. I put every doctrine back on the shelf. And I said to the Lord, Lord, if, if, I'm, if I seek you, I'm going to show you in the scriptures what the Bible tells you, you, you have to do in order to actually get this right. You can't just do this and say, Lord, I, I'll do whatever. And then, you know, what some people have is they do these things, they put, they, put, they put things back on the shelf, and then all of a sudden they see a sign or a wonder. Someone walks up to them and tells them, this or that or the other thing. They just believe them because they're saying, well, the Lord must be talking to me. I put all these things back on the shelf. There was a time where the Lord reproved me alongside many of the brothers here. A homeless man came into our midst and prophesied to us and it was the word of the Lord. It was powerful and it caused the body to become one even more than it was before. It wasn't But a few weeks after that, that we were tested in what the book of Deuteronomy says when this man began to actually sin in the presence and become a troubled fountain to other sinners. And I had to just look at him in the face and say, you know, what you said to us in prophecy, we don't despise, but what you do in works, we do despise. And I had to walk away. We had to all walk away from that person, even though he helped us. He helped straighten some things out. The Lord brought him in. And when we were seeking the Lord, what he was saying was matching up with what we were seeking. But the moment he started to veer away from that, we had to have the keen eye to be able to understand when that happens. Otherwise, we would have gotten married to something else. You understand that Solomon had many wives. But Solomon is writing about the wife of your youth. He's saying, why? Why would you embrace the bosom of another? Why would you do that? Yet he himself is shown in the scripture to have done that. Is that for me to speak upon Solomon's shame? No. It's for me to show you and admonish you to be able to understand that even the mighty, the mighty have fallen. Why have the mighty fallen? 
because the transaction is get married to something else. Be satisfied with what just came your way. Jesus is saying here, I know your works and your labor and your patience and how you cannot bear them which are evil. And you have tried them. You've tried them which say they are apostles and are not. That's what we've done. We've tried them. We've seen these people are not doing the truth. Jesus said, what they bid you to do, do, but what they do, do not do. What they tell you with their lips, what Todd White says with his lips may be the truth, but we we have to actually, and through this video series, we have to show you Todd White says this, but Todd White's doing this. And so many other members that were at the send, if not all of them, have corrupted their, their doings, if not then at the very moment they decided to be a part of that, that event, that is when that transgression occurred. Because the Bible actually says, this is what you're not supposed to do. This is what God will actually spare you from if you've pleased him. I'm going to show it to you in the scripture. He says, you have found them and you have found them liars and has borne and has paid and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. This is Jesus telling the church of Ephesus, you've done all these good things, you're you're very virtuous, but I have this one thing, I have this one thing against you. You have left your first love. Thou hast left thy first love. Notice how he's not talking about, just hear what I'm saying. He's not talking about, you You know, you don't know that there's any false apostles. He's not talking to the church that's at the sin. He's talking to those who've already found out that the sin is wrong. He's saying, you've already tried them that call themselves apostles and are not, and you found them to be false, and you have patience, and you're holding my, and you've labored for my name's sake, and you're doing the good things, you're doing those good things, but I have this one thing against you. This is a transaction most notably done by, in the Bible, Judah. This is not a, this is not a transaction that is done by Ephraim. This is not a transaction of the northern tribes. This is a transaction of those who are trying to hold fast. This is the devil's tactic on those who are holding fast. It says that a man shall no longer be with his mother and father, but shall do what? Cleave. Cleave to his wife. And the understanding, the drunkenness, the sleep, all of the things that try to come on that generation to try to get them to just slowly just let go and embrace another wife. And they'll say it's the Lord. They'll say it's the Lord. He says here, remember... Therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the what? First works. I looked up that word first. It actually means principle. The principle works. Do the principle works or else I will come unto thee quickly and and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent, except thou metanoia, except thou change your thinking, change the mind, because you've gone away from the mind of Christ. You've gone away from the most important thing to Jesus. The weightier matters, the principal things. 
So if Jesus is saying this to the church of Ephesus, then what is he really referring to? We have to have somewhere else in the Bible that gives us more of an understanding of who the wife of our youth is. I just talked to you about the one in Solomon, but let's go towards Malachi chapter two and I'll show you exactly what Malachi is trying to communicate to the people about what they have done. And they're so confused about it because of the, because of the actual way that it looks, the way the devil makes it look. They're actually in confusion. And they're asking questions. Where, what, how? How, does this, how is that working? How have we dealt treacherously? How have we done, done bad things towards our, our wife? Malachi chapter two and verse 10, it says, have we, all, have we not all one father? Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? See, these questions are, Malachi provoking love in the people, saying, don't we have one dad? Don't we have one father? Don't we have one God that created us? Why is there another God around us? Why is there another Jesus? Why is there another version? Don't we have one father? Have not, has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by doing what? Profaning the covenant of our fathers. Profaning the covenant of our fathers. There is a covenant, there is a marriage, there is a covenant that God has put in the earth. And Jesus Christ said a new covenant, do I give you? Jesus came, it says his covenant speaks of better things. It is the covenant that was to be revealed from the beginning. All the other covenants We're a type and shadow of this covenant and all those other covenants are fulfilled in this covenant. The covenant to Abraham, fulfilled in Jesus Christ and his covenant. We become the children of Abraham by taking the covenant of Jesus Christ. All those covenants, all those covenants, all the promises of God are yes and amen in who? Christ Jesus. So we are at the very, very top of this mountain. And if you consider those that have gone before us is they had to lay down the covenants that they had to lay down. Abraham had to fulfill the covenant to him. Noah had to fulfill the covenant to him. And for some reason, the Israelites of today feel as if they don't have something to fulfill. I know it must have been really hard. It must have been really hard for Noah to wake up every morning, and go and preach righteousness, and then sit there for hours and hours building a boat, not having ever seen rain before. What faith? The Bible says Noah moved with fear. He was moved with fear. He feared God. He said, it's going to happen. I've never seen it, but it's going to happen. And there were things trying to say, Noah, take a break today. Noah, you don't have to, you don't have to go out there today. It's not going to rain yet. Noah, come on. This is not as serious as you think it is. People telling him that. Other things saying, Noah, you've got other things to do. Noah, there's other things that you have to do. Uh, Noah, your whole, you're going to waste your whole life on this boat? You're going to waste your whole life, Noah? You're going to waste your whole life on this boat? Why don't, you, why don't you live a little? Why don't you have a little bit of fun? Why don't you just relax a little? Just have a little bit of a good time, Noah. But Noah fears God. And the Lord says the same thing to Abraham when he's about to 
stab his own son with, with, with a, the knife that he has. And the Lord says, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay, lay hands on the lad. For now I know, he doesn't say that you love me. He says that you fear me. And so people want to get up today on pulpits and they want to teach people about how to fear God by saying you should reverence God. I don't know about you, but when there's dead bodies all around you because you're the only family in a boat, I think at that point you can understand how terrifying God is. But for some reason in your mind, when somebody taught you how to play music, They said, it's not such a big deal. You don't have to learn that. You don't have to fear God that way. Just reverence him. The Bible actually says fear and reverence in a single verse. So is it just repeating itself or is there a difference? There is a difference. If you read Malachi chapter two, just earlier, it says the priests, they didn't lay it to heart. Oh, now you priests, because you did not lay it to heart, God will curse you. And if you're supposed to be a royal priesthood, which is according to the the New Testament apostles, they're saying you are a royal priesthood. You're a king. You better find out what a king does. And you're a priest. You better find out what a priest does. And Malachi is written to priests. And saying you're, you're not laying this to heart. That's what Malachi is saying in Malachi 2. He's saying, you're not laying the commandments of God to heart. You're not putting it. You're not saying, I will do these commandments. I will not depart from these commandments. You know what I've seen? This is what people have done. Something new comes into their life and they just start leaving off something old. It's almost as if they're like a spiritual abacus of sorts. They just hit the refresh button on every time a new calculation comes in. But those who know God don't erase the previous calculations. Those who know God remember the statutes and judgments. If God did that to Saul, he could do it to me. Those who fear God take the admonitions for according to 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples and they were written down for our admonition. We can be admonished knowing that if God dealt with them that way, Paul is saying this in 1 Corinthians 10, that he will deal with us in this way. And so because of the lack of the fear of the Lord, you find people opening their arms and saying, well, Let me embrace another. By profaning the covenant of our fathers. That's why Malachi, the end of Malachi, uh, his his writing, he's saying very clearly, and I'm going to send you Elijah. He's going to turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers. Why? Because this generation has lost and profaned the covenant of our fathers. You've dealt treacherously against your brother in doing so. It says, Judah has dealt treacherously and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned what? The holiness of the Lord, which he loved. He loved the holiness of the Lord. He loved being separate. He loved being away. He loved being with just his wife. He loved the covenant of his fathers and he loved the holiness of God. It says, but he has married the daughter of a strange God. You see, when Jesus is giving this admonishment, You think, wow, this admonishment is very harsh in Revelation chapter two. He's saying you've lost your first love. I'll tell you the truth. To lose your first love is to find your second love. 
to lose your first love, you would have to let go of that first love to embrace the love of another. That's why Jesus is saying, if you don't repent, I'm going to come and I'm going to remove your candlestick out of its place. That's why the judgment is so serious on this because you're basically holding on to another wife and, and the Lord is saying, you've forgotten the holiness of God. And Todd White wants to get up and say, God wants holiness back in the church. We watched that. We watched that. We saw that whole speech. God wants holiness. Where is holiness in the church? Why do you think Todd White can't find it? Why do you think he can't find it? Why is he screaming at all the people there? Screaming at them. Where is holiness in the church? Where is it? The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. What do you start doing? You just start beating sheep. Where's holiness? Where's holiness? Doesn't it start with the priests? Doesn't it start with Judah? Not profaning the covenant of their God? Doesn't it start with you? Pictures of you at Disney World? Doesn't it start with you? Or where's holiness? Where's holiness? Where is it? Where is it? Yes, where is it? Because you've embraced someone else. You've embraced something else. You've embraced a different gospel. And so you have to preach your, your fables. You have to preach your ideas because by no means could you possibly preach what the Bible says because you've left off that wife. You can't talk about your wife when you've dealt treacherously with her because you not talking about her is you dealing treacherously with her. Well, there's a well-favored harlot. There's a well-favored harlot. Favor is deceitful. People will like you more if you say this. If you just don't say this as much, then you can grow your church. What about if you just start preaching love? That concept is so foreign. We are preaching love. <laughs> this is love. It's so strong, it hates evil. It's so strong, it kills anything that, that's, not, that's not real. That's not sincere. This is about love. Why is your mind so foreign? Probably because you've married a strange God. How many times were the disciples astonished at Jesus' words? Is Jesus just, is Jesus just trying to be epic? Is that, is that your assumption of the gospel? Jesus is just trying to be epic. Get behind me, Satan. Wow, that was so epic. If, if that's your thought of the gospel, you have a cheapened gospel. Jesus is just, He's being the truth. And the disciples are completely astonished because they, in their own minds, have been taught by their generation that has knives in their teeth how to fornicate against God. So when Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, these are new concepts. Where's Satan? Me? I'm Peter. Be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees. Does he, does he need bread? Where's bread? Where's the bread? 
They've been taught to deal in earthly matters. They had to unlearn it all. And Jesus is saying, how long must I be with you? Erase it all. Erase it all. Erase it all. It's all in there. This is the truth. I'm not trying to be a certain way. I am a certain way. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And so what comes out of him is profound. Why? Because it is found of God. And now he's spending time with men. And he's shaping these men. And every time they come in with a foreign, strange idea, Lord, how do we feed these people? He said, you feed them. Lord, we don't have any food. At one point, Jesus says to them, did I not feed 5,000? Did I not feed 4,000? How is it that you're saying he must be asking for physical bread? Why are you still there? Why is your mind constantly carnal? Put on my mind, put on the mind of Christ and actually have it be meat to do your father's will. He's trying to raise them. He's trying to raise these little ones that are, they, they want the Lord, they want the Lord. And if you want the Lord, you've got to become like that child who says, okay, I don't understand what that means, but we're not getting him bread and he's gonna, he has more bread than we know about. Let's just keep going. I don't know what this means, Lord, but I know you're there and I am like a child. Peter's saying, Lord, we've left all. We don't have anything else, Lord. You are the Christ. You have the words of life. We, we don't have anything, Lord. We've left all for you. Lord, we've done, we've basically gotten rid of our whole lives, our whole minds. Lord, fill us. We've become these empty vessels who are just at your mercy. We are poor. We are needy. Lord, we need you. Jesus comes up and says to the rich young ruler, he loves him and says, but you lack one thing. You're so rich that you lack one thing. Sell everything you have. Sell it all and come and follow me. But for some reason, that man walked away sad. And the reason he walked away sad is because he was married to the things that came into his life rather than being married to the Lord. He said, these I've kept. Just what Jesus said in Revelation 2, you've kept all these things, but you've forgotten one thing. Do the first works. What are the first works? What are they? He's saying here, if you profane the covenant of your fathers, you have profaned the holiness of God and you've married the daughter of a strange God. Listen to what the Bible says God will do. The Lord will cut off the man that does this. This is why Jesus is saying, if you don't repent, I will take away your lampstand. If you don't change your mind, and stop dealing treacherously against the wife of your youth or forsake, forsaking your first love. The Lord will cut off the man that does this, the master and the scholar. The master and the scholar. How many people do you know that are masters and scholars that know nothing about what we're talking about today? You can walk around having gone to Bible school, having run a Bible school. There's people running Bible schools right now that have no idea that they're actually married to the wrong Jesus. They have no idea. Because the concept of their husband is all okay over here, but the concept of their wife is completely dealt treacherously against. Do you love Jesus? Yes, I love Jesus. That's my husband. Then why have you dealt treacherously against your wife? Why have you profaned the holiness of God? Because that transaction caused you to get married to another Jesus. That transaction caused you to actually marry some other God, the daughter of a strange God. Now you're actually married to someone else. And the Lord will cut off the master and the scholar out of the tabernacles of Jacob. And him that offering offers 
an offering unto the Lord of hosts. This is what people have done. And you saw this at the send. It says, and this have you done again. You've done it again. That's the admonishment to those of you who've come out of Babylon, who've woken up. The admonishment is that you're in danger of doing this again. Don't think to yourself, oh, I'll never be like that. Oh, I'll never be, I'll never be like that. I'll never do that. The ends of her are death. The transaction doesn't happen at the death point. The transaction happens at the honey point. Her lips drip honey, but her feet lead down to hell. It sounds like the word of God. It looks like the word of God. It acts like the word of God in part, but subtly profanes the holiness of God. I spoke with a street preacher. He's going to a church and he's trying to find any virtue he can find to just say, I can actually go to church. He doesn't want to forsake the gathering of himself. Which, that needs to be in place, but you have to find out how to do that in the last days. That's actually something the Lord is actually leading us to do. For those of you who listen in the week, and I know some people don't get this far in the message, so I could say this. The Lord has actually instructed us to actually start to gather more, not just on YouTube, but gather online more in a more intimate setting with those who are truly seeking God, those who can actually make it through. So if that's you, and you desire to be around real family, I do believe the Lord is saying in the, in the, in the prophets, he says, gather yourselves together, O nation not desired. How do you know you'll, you'll actually be a part of the Lord's family? Somebody doesn't want to be around you because you preach the gospel. Somebody hates you. Somebody despises you because the Bible says the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. The Bible says the poor man entreats his neighbor, though he speaks with words, they, he is not heard, he's put away. Though he, in, though he tries to bring many words, tries to tell him, no, the Bible says the Bible, we don't want to hear, get that away from us. We're walking inside of the stadium of the sand. It wasn't 15 minutes, but they, they said, get out of here. Get out of here. And we're, we're standing, I remember we're standing there, we're, we're singing this song and it was very powerful. And the moment we start singing this song and we had those signs up, there's certain people who are looking at us and they're, they're listening to the song and they're listening and then there's other people. And I noticed in my corner of my eye, it was on the left. I, I, I won't forget this easily. I noticed that there was a woman standing with her young people and she said, everyone, now let's do this. And they started chanting. They all started chanting this chant and I was watching her. She was telling them, go louder, go louder. And I was looking, I was saying, this woman, this woman, they don't want to hear the truth. They want to shut it down. They want to say, don't cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from our presence. That's the transaction that they made. They don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear judgment. They don't want to hear those things. They completely despise judgment. He says here, and this have you done again. How do they do it? Covering the altar of the Lord with tears with weeping and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore or receive it with goodwill at your hand. The Lord is saying, I cannot, I'm not coming. I'm not coming. It's as if to say, invite your husband for dinner while you have another man with you. Open the door and say, come in, Lord. And he sits at the table and he's sitting right with another man. And he's saying, I'm sorry, we haven't met before. Who are you? Oh, I'm, 
I'm with her. Actually, no, I'm with her. No, I'm with, I'm with her. No, she, she chose me. She brought me in here. Okay? Let me talk with her. I'm going to talk with her. Hey, why is this other man here? Hey, no, 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 no. No, Lord, you're allowed to come here. You're allowed to come here, Lord. We want you here, Lord. We want you, Lord. We only want you, Lord. They're going to sing all kinds of songs. They're going to sing songs to their husband all day long, but they've dealt treacherously with the wife of their youth. They profane the holiness of God. They profane the covenant of their fathers. And then they want to turn around and they want to say, but we're worshiping God. But we're worshiping Jesus. They don't realize what, they've, what, what transaction they've actually done. They don't realize what they've actually done. And now they cover the altar with tears. Do I think that Todd White was not sincere when he said, where is holiness in the church? He may have been sincere. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying he's sincere, but he may have been. He's saying, where is it? Why has the church lost power? Why is the church, you don't realize that it's because of a transaction that you didn't do? You left off the first pr principal works of the faith? Now all of a sudden you want the power of God to come again? But they're crying. Lord, I love you. Lord, come, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord. Please show us your will. Show what is the Lord supposed to do with that? What is God supposed to do with that? Imagine if someone is crying to you while they're holding on to their strange wife. Please come and visit me. Please, Lord, show us your glory. God, we want to be with you. And the Lord's saying, you don't want to be with me. If you wanted to be with me, you would get rid of that strange woman. You'd get rid of those strange ideas and you would not have profaned the covenant of your fathers and the holiness of God. You've dealt treacherously with the wife of your youth and you've married the daughter of a strange God. There's a covenant there. You actually have to make a covenant. The Lord's going to cut off those people. The master and the scholar. Even if you do it with goodwill, there's people coming up to the, there's people at the sand and you're lifting your hands to God. And you're saying, Lord, I want to know you. I want to experience you. The Bible says their children are children of whoredoms. I will not, I will not, what does he say? I will not punish them. And that, sound, that, can, that can sound good if you have a backwards mind, but the Bible says despise not the chastening of the Lord. The number one thing that you should be loving right now is the fact that God disciplines you. If you do something wrong, it should cost you. And the Lord shows you, this is what you did. This is the result. But when you do something wrong and nothing happens, you better think to yourself, I am in a lot of danger. I'm not saying that the Lord is not merciful. We, the Bible says that the sure mercies of David, look at David, he, he had a plague, come on Israel, he went and sought the Lord and the Lord stayed the plague. There are times where the Lord will have mercy. What I'm saying is if you live your life and there's just no consequences, you're in a very, very bad place. You are married to the strange Jesus. You are married to a strange God. If you are actually prospering and, you, and there are things in your life that you know you're dealing treacherously. I was called by a man at one point. And this man is telling me how he goes into churches and he tries to help people that are, that are, that are bound to a strange woman. He's going to help them because he's got the truth. 
He, he loves the Lord and, and he, you know, he, he's trying to help people. So he knows the truth. So he goes in and he used to be a part of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And he came out of that. And now he knows the truth. And because now he knows the truth, he only has three friends and they study the word together and everything's fine. So it sounds good. And then I start asking him questions. Are you reading the word every day? Well, so I have a job and my job it was a certain way, and well, I, I haven't been able to seek the Lord's face every day. I haven't been able to. I, I've, um, I haven't really done that. I haven't really done that. It's been like probably like once every week, once every two weeks, I'll like read the word. I'll sit down and really read the word, like really good. And I'm just saying, Lord, just have mercy on me. You know how busy my job is. You know how much money I make. He was in roofing. And he's saying, you know, my job, the way it works, I've got to go locations, I've got to be there, I've got to do all these things. I'm saying, okay. I mean, that's what the Bible says will happen when Jesus calls for, for you to come to the feast. Uh, well, I've got a piece of land. I, I, I must have needs to tend it. Oh, I have an oxen. I, I need to prove it. I have something. I've worked to do, Lord. I, I just bought a, a new ox. I've got to go prove it, Lord. You know, I, you know how things are, Lord. Lord, you gave me this job, you know. Lord, I've got, to, I've got to work the job, right? Mm. That's a transaction. When you wake up every morning and you know in your spirit, I should read the word, but there's something else telling you, you got to get to that. You got to do this. You got to have this. You're, you're going to fall behind if you do this. And you're going to have this if you do. Okay. It says, if I don't consider Jerusalem my chief joy, let my hand forget its cunning. You you should actually forget what you do if you don't consider the Lord first. But that's not the transaction that the devil's trying to put in front of you. The transaction the devil wants to put in front of you is, you don't have time right now. Just, okay, just rush it, rush it, just rush your time. And here's your wife, the wife of your youth. Here's your first love, sitting down at a meal and you're just eating fast. Where are you going? I've got, I've got to go. I've got some other things I've got to do. I've got to, I've got to do this. Are we going to spend time together? Yes, we're spending time together. What did, what did you want to say to me? I was going to say like, have we considered, so I don't have a lot of time right now. Can you just say what you're trying to say? There are people that are, that, are, that are running with people from the sin and they have an entire campaign because they believe that, that revival is going to sweep all across America. And you know what they said? They said, that I, I heard the person talk about why they're so upset that it just, it's not happening. They said, it's not happening and this is the reason. Because people are too busy. And so the Lord gave them this campaign Give him 15. And if everybody in the body of Christ just gave the Lord 15 minutes a day, there would be revival. Are you, is this, are you, how, where does your mind have to be to say that people are so busy? How are you profaning the covenant of your fathers when Abraham is sitting, dwelling with the Lord in a tent with nowhere to live? But the place that he's standing. And now you want to say, let's, let's dial it back to giving God 15. If everybody can give God 15, then God will be happy. God wants 24, 7, every day of the week, every single hour, every minute, every second, every part of your substance. That is the holiness of God. And you want to say that 15 equals revival? What a shame. This is the deal that is made. Because the other transaction is unthinkable. The Bible says there's robbery in the house of the wicked because they refuse to do what? Judgment. 
That's the unthinkable thing. What will happen with my building when my church goes from 3,000 members to 12? It will be the church of the Lord. Few there be that find it. Thank the Lord. You know what you'd be doing? You'd be reckoning with what was there anyway. You'd be saying, there's 12 people here that want the truth. Why don't we just go with those 12? The others are going to die and go to hell anyway. Why don't we just go with the 12? Why don't we just go with seven? Why don't we just go with four? Wow, Lord, if we can keep four. Where's this mindset? You see, because the transaction doesn't feel that way. That's the strangeness of this, of this, the movable ways of this strange woman is it doesn't feel that way. It's starting to play on your, you know, this is how the, this is how the strange woman does it. She's just trying to get you to feel something. Don't you, don't you love those people? Don't you want those people to live? Well, yes, I mean, I, well, I mean, didn't you minister the gospel? To, look how many of them you baptized. Well, sometimes you got to drive a spear through both an Israelite and a strange woman to get it done. Read the statutes and judgments of God. That's the unthinkable thing. That's the unthinkable thing. So what they do, they'll, they'll just, they'll be weeping. Lord, we love you, Lord, please be with us, God. Please be with us, Lord. Please, Lord, please. We want to be with you, Lord. You want to be with me? Cut it off. You want to be with me? Do the first works. What are those first works? Let's keep reading. He says, yet you say, wherefore? Lord, where have we done this? Here's, here's the people of God saying to Malachi, what do you mean? We haven't done that. How does he say? What does he say they do? Because the Lord has been a witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and, thy, and the wife of thy what? Covenant. Covenant. And did not he make one? Yet had the residue of the spirit and wherefore one? that he might seek a godly seed. That's the reason there's only one. My dove, my beloved, is but one. Many daughters have dealt virtuously. Many, many people have done virtuous things for God. There's only one dove. There are three score queens and four score concubines. But my beloved, my, my undefiled, is but one. Esther, many women were going un undergoing the purification process. One woman became queen. There's virgins without number. We've kept ourselves for the Lord in this way. We've kept ourselves for the Lord in this way. I found out who the false apostles were and that they're liars. And I also have patience and I also have done labored. I've also done these things. And the Lord's saying, nevertheless, you profaned this one thing, the holiness of God, which is the covenant of your fathers. It says this, therefore, take heed to what? To your spirit, 
to your spirit. Take heed to what? Your spirit. When the Lord comes in, he comes into your house. Now the tabernacle, now, now, now you are as the, as the holy temple of God. And you as the priest in the temple are meeting with the holy, in the holy of holies with the Lord. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead and that was inside of the holy of holies. When that curtain was torn, that same spirit went up and was no longer dwelling in a tabernacle made by the man's of hand, a hands of man. No longer. Now, on the day of Pentecost, comes the Holy Spirit to indwell a holy temple. And the Lord is saying, take heed to your spirit. Because the Lord, he's watching over his word to perform it. The Bible says the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. The dunamis, the power of God happened when the word of God came forth. What are you supposed to be doing in here? You're supposed to be communing with the Holy Spirit. You're supposed to be having a relationship with the wife of your youth saying, this is my God. I will not marry. I'm going to get to know him so well that if I hear anything else, that's not of him. And if I hear one thing that's not of him, I'll be able to say, that's not him. That's not him. I already know what it says in Deuteronomy. That's not him. That's not him. I was speaking with a man and this, uh, at this end. And he, he said, you, you just come off like you know everything. I said, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. You're just, all you're doing is trying to sword fight me. I said, what do you mean? You just want to sit here and compare scriptures. I'm like, you haven't said one scripture. This is not a sword fight. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. He says, oh, you know, I, I, I'm, you don't even know who I am. I said, I know who you are. He says, how do you know who I am? You don't even know who I am. Have you ever met me before? I said, I see it on you. I see the clothes you're wearing. I see the way you're talking. You don't have the lips of knowledge. You're not a priest to the Lord. Oh, there you are again, exalting yourself. You're putting yourself in the position of Moses. I said, I'm putting myself in the position of Moses? I said, Moses prayed for the people. Actually, I didn't say that. I said, maybe I am, but not like, but, but it's because I love you. It's not because I'm again, I'm not against you in this. I'm come here to bring the Bible. And he's saying, no, you're putting yourself in a higher seat. I'm saying, I'm not putting myself in a higher seat. Do you understand? I'm trying to tell you what the Bible says. No, you just want to sword fight. Why don't you talk normal with me? I'm like, this is normal. Jesus, when he was speaking with his disciples, we just said that. He is being normal. Do you perceive what I'm saying? And I want to repent for saying that. I, I really do repent for, for speaking as, as if I said something. I want to convey the ideas. There's so much conversation that happens in those conversations. And I need to not say, I said. I need to say, I said something to the effect of. It would be better for me to say those things than to just say those, that I said something when I didn't. Please forgive me. Father. He's saying, take Heed to your spirit. Because your spirit is the one that can embrace another. God is not unfaithful. His spirit dwelling in you is a faithful companion, a helper to you. He's not going to not be faithful one day. He's watching over his word to perform it. When you put faith in the word of God, when your spirit says, Lord, I just read this in the word this morning and I believe it for my life. The Lord says, now we can do something. 
Now things can happen. Now strongholds can be torn down in your mind. Now it can actually bring forth change. Now it can actually do things in your life. But when your spirit chooses to run another direction, he's saying, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. You have to take heed to your spirit. It says, for the Lord, the God of Israel says that he hates putting away. He hates putting away. Think about how the Lord must have felt when we're standing in the midst of the sin and we're actually bringing the truth and they just put the truth away. He hates it. He hates it. But you might be looking at the sin and saying, wow, that's terrible, look at them. Yet you, yourself, when somebody tries to reprove you, you begin to do the same thing. In pride, you begin to say, I didn't do that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm justified. I'm fine. Instead of listening, hearkening, listening, okay, okay, this is what the Bible says. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I must be wrong. My spirit, my, I yield to the word of God. I'm wrong. Yes, okay, this person is proving it. They're bringing more scripture. And not just that, it's spiritually, it's spiritually being brought forth. Because the Bible says the letter kills, but the spirit brings life. Someone could bring you a Bible scripture and they say, you're guilty of this. And it's as if to say, they're trying to, to, to get you to sway from that, that covenant in either way. They want you to sway from it so that it's dead. Or they want you to sway from it so that you put it away. The Lord hates the putting away. I've said this on this channel and I'll say this many times and I pray that everyone that preaches from this place would say this. There have been times where even people who consider themselves our enemies, very, very much so our enemies, come and point out something that we're doing. Point out something I have done personally. Do I despise that? Well, no. If it doesn't come from the mouth of God, then it doesn't impact me and shouldn't. But if that person says something and then brings up a Bible scripture and what they're saying is true, it's not time for me to defend myself. If I know God is my defender, my, my duty as a priest my duty as a king, and I'm not exalting myself because we're all kings and priests. I'm saying my duty as a priest is to say, it has to be right in my spirit with God's spirit. It has to be right between me and the Lord. I have to have peace with God, not peace with, I've got to keep this going as long as I can. Untamed truth never started in that way and may it never become those things. And so... We will get up and say sorry if we're wrong. But the Lord takes up our cause. Let it be proven that the Lord does these things. Not that we do. And the Bible says if if the Lord doesn't build the house, the laborers labor in vain. I'm not trying to just vainly build a YouTube channel. If that was the case, we wouldn't have so many unsubscribes. We're doing what it says in Jeremiah 5. We're going through the streets to see if there can be any man that can execute judgment and God will pardon it. Any man that could say, this is a weightier matter. This are, these are the first works. I'm going to do the very first things. And the Lord says, and I'll pardon it. I'll have mercy on you. 
If you'll repent of taking away these first things and bring them back, stop putting away, stop putting away those first things. It says, for one covers violence with his garment, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. It says, you have wearied me. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, where have we wearied him? It says, when you say that everyone that does evil is good, in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or where is the God of judgment? Notice these two things here. What are they? What is it when you call evil good and good evil? The Bible says, what must be without dissimulation? Love. Love must be without dissimulation abhorring that which is evil and cleaving to your wife. The love of God. It's a weightier matter. You have wearied the Lord. How have we wearied the Lord? You've done two things. You've said that those who do evil are good in the sight of the Lord. And where is the God of judgment? The love of God and judgment. The love of God and judgment. Luke eleven forty two. 42, Jesus said, but woe unto you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, but you pass over what? Judgment and the love of God. This is not a new thing that the Pharisees were doing. This had been happening in the time of Malachi. He's saying, you have forgotten your first love. What makes a Pharisee a Pharisee? is he won't love God to the place of letting the holiness of God be what it's supposed to be. He will diminish the holiness of God and he will not and refuse to do judgment and the God of judgment will not be found in his midst. And Jesus is saying, woe unto you because you tithe all these things. You do everything right. You have all these virtues. You even go to the place of tithing of the mint and the root. But what you have not done is the, the weightier matters, judgment, judgment, and the love of God. If you love me, Jesus says, you will obey my commandments. If you love your husband, then you will obey your commandments, the commandments of God that he gives to you. This is what we have to realize is that to serve God, there must not be another strange God among you. We talked about this weeks ago when we talked about Deuteronomy 32 and the song of Moses that he's singing. He's saying, Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked and he married the daughter of a strange God. What does it say there? It's, it says, I want to get the exact... But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fat fatness. Then he forsook the God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. It's the same transaction. Lightly esteeming your wife. 
rushing, rushing your time with the Lord, rushing, trying to get it over with because you have other things that are new that have come into your life and I've got to just, got to do those things. You know, I've got to do those things and the Lord wants me to do those things. The Lord didn't want you to turn away from your wife. The Lord wanted you to tend to the things of God. And Jesus is saying, return to these first works. Now I have a few more scriptures and many of them are just one verse. But where we're going to focus a lot of our time right now is Proverbs chapter 2. Because in Proverbs chapter 2, we are going to find this exact, this exact admonishment. What, what happens when you don't keep this? And what happens when you don't take heed to your spirit? There's actually things that the Lord lets go of too. There's actually things that the Lord allows to drift off. It's a very dangerous thing because remember, you're, you're getting married. You're getting married. Proverbs chapter two, verse one, my son, say my son. Say they that do the will of their father and those that walk by the spirit are the what? The sons of God. He says, my son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with, with thee so that thou incline thy ear to wisdom and do exactly what Malachi in the beginning says in the Malachi chapter two, apply thine heart to understanding. Now listen to the way that you have to be desperate for God's word. If you don't stay in this place, you're going to see the transaction that comes. It says, yea, if you cry after knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her, as silver and search for her as for what? Hid treasures. Then, 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 and only then. It says, you, if you seek me, you will find me, but only if you seek me with all your heart. That's what, that's what the prophet's telling us to do. Here it's saying, if you seek me as for silver, as for hid treasures, then you shall understand what the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God for who gives wisdom for the Lord that's what it says for the Lord gives wisdom and out sorry for the Lord gives wisdom out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He lays up, listen to what the Lord has done. He lays up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. When you wake up in the morning, when you go to bed at night and you make a decision, there are sometimes at night, I want to let you know this. There's sometimes at night, I pray that this beats slothfulness out of you. There's sometimes at night where I'm going to bed at 2 and 3 a.m. Because there's some ordinances that the Lord has in my life that I have to be in that position. And at that very time, my body is tired. My eyes are tired. But you know what I will not do? And I've set this in my heart and I pray, Lord, that the Lord would keep me in this. I'm saying this to instruct you. I will not let sleep to my eyes until I have been with him. And there are times where I am standing up and I'm walking around in my house. And I'm saying, Lord, I'm here. Lord, take my mind off of what I was just focused on. I am here, Lord. I am here. Because I'm not going to go to sleep. It's not considered sleep to me. It's not considered life to me. It's not considered anything to me until he is happy with me. If I choose to go to sleep, that's my sleep. That's not my spirit and his spirit communing together. That's my sleep. I'm walking away from him. I'm putting him away and I'm saying, Lord, I have to sleep. I am tired. What kind of life do you think you're living when the Lord is not an all-consuming fire? Lord, if I don't 
beat out this oil right now. If I don't praise your name right now, if I don't walk in this house, put my hands up and say, Lord, you're beautiful, and start singing. Do I feel like doing that? This has nothing to do with my feelings. This has to do with me loving the Lord. This has to do with me giving God the glory. When you wake up in the morning, there's that sudden, well, you, you got to go. You've got to go. Your mind is starting to write. You've got to go. You've got. That is the pressure of that strange voice upon you. Trying to get you to make a, a deal, a treacherous deal. Make a deal with me, as the devil is saying to you. Make a deal. Just today. Tomorrow you can do it, but just today. Make the deal against the wife of your youth. It's as if to say, with absolute stoutness, the enemy is telling you, you know, God doesn't keep your job. You've got to go and take care of that because, you know, if you, you know, the Lord is this and then your job is that. It's like, are you serious? God gives you the power to get wealth. When I was in apostasy, I remember waking up in mornings and thinking to myself, there's, I can't, I can't, I can't have a quiet time right now. I can't do it. There's too much to do for the Lord. There's too much to do for the Lord. I started serving the church. There's too much to do. I've got too much to go. Too much is on my mind. I can't focus right now. I can't focus right now. You can't focus because there's some of you that's still alive. You better die. You better kill yourself spiritually, not physically. You better crucify your flesh. You have to think about what's going on. The transactions are small. The transactions are just a little bit here and there. Just... Just, just give, just give 90% to the Lord this morning. Just give 90% tonight. Or actually, you know what? Just a little, just a little. God's okay with it. God's okay with it. I'll tell you the truth. When you endeavor in love with God, you realize that the deception that the devil was ha- had tried to come up to, to you on your mind, you're so tired. It's already 3 a.m. What are you going to do? Pray now? You don't even have the right mind to pray right now. Still happening. Still doing it. Sorry. Sorry, flesh. You don't get it. You don't get your way. Sorry. Doesn't happen. Doesn't work like that. But I'm so tired. It's like people, they're, they're, they're coming up and they're saying, well, you know, it's already proven on Google, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't go without food or water for three days. I'm like, That's not true. <laughs> I've watched people break that right in front of my eyes. It's not true. Maybe for a man it's true. But if you, in your spirit, you are willing to be with God, You're talking about the God who made you out of dust. He can't sustain your flesh for more than three days. If you're led by the Spirit of God, Jesus, led by the Spirit of God, fasted for 40 days. Well, it's because he was Jesus. There's other people who have done that. In the Bible and even nowadays, they're doing it. Your mind is constantly trying to tell you, just, you know, it's just too much. You know, you you don't have to do that. You don't have to do this. You've got to keep the charge. You've got to say, these are needful things. I'm not dealing treacherously in this way. I'm going to be with the Lord. I'm going to be with him. I'm going to take heed to my spirit, Lord, to be with you, to be with you, to be with you. It's what I want, Lord. It's why I'm alive. It's why I'm here. 
You have to beat your body with blows and make it your slave. Tell it you're going to do this. Then the sacrifice of the Lord will be pure. Because right now, there's people crying at the feet of Jesus in church, but they're treacherously dealing all week long. And the Lord's saying, where are my people? Where's the people who will not profane the holiness of God? Where are the people who are going to keep this covenant that that I gave to the fathers? Where are these people that are not going to put put me away and say, you know, times have changed. How prideful do you have to be to say times have changed? You have to be fairly, you have to be fairly stout in your words to say times have changed. The Bible actually tells you to not be given to those who are, who are subject to change. Times have changed. Now you don't have to make a trip to a particular place once a year. Now you meet with the Lord in your living room. Times have changed. And what has it made it? It's made it much more powerful, much more capable, much more possible for each man to know the Lord their God. Before, you had to know the priest. You had to ask the priest to to, to do the sacrifice for you. Now you have a high priest. Times have changed. It's become better for you. You have a better covenant. You have a a covenant that speaks of better things. It only got better for you. Yet for some reason, you'll say, times have changed. You know, people, they used to just sit around all day and they could seek God and things, but I'm so busy. I I was telling you the story of this man who's telling me that he's not spending time with the Lord every day. And he's talking to me at the same time about his physical wife. He's saying that his physical wife doesn't want anything to do with him. He says his physical wife doesn't love the Lord. His physical wife doesn't want, to be, doesn't want to be with him. And the Lord shows me instantly what's happening. There's a spiritual problem. And I'm not saying this in pride. I'm saying the Lord just gave me a vision of this, of this man. He, he just instantly, the Lord showed me something's wrong with this man's back spiritually. This man has a a back. He has a back problem in in the spirit. And I said to him, the Lord has told me what happened to you. And he said, well, well, what is a tie? Please tell me. I'm listening. I'm listening. I said, the Lord told me you've dealt treacherously with the wife of your youth. The reason why your marriage is the way it is is because you've dealt treacherously with your wife of your youth in the spirit. And so the, you've also dealt treacherously with your wife in the flesh. And I said, and the Lord is telling me, you have spinal columns that are not in place. There's something wrong with your back. And he says to me, Ty, I don't know how to explain this to you. Only two to three weeks ago, I started having immense pain in my back. I've gone to the doctor several times and I have these, they're saying I have something wrong with my back where some of my plates are out of line. I said, this is spiritual. You have a physical back problem just like you have a physical wife problem because you have dealt treacherously with the wife of your youth. He received the word. And I messaged him weeks later and I said to him, are you dealing better with the wife of your youth? (sighs) Not really. Swallowed up. Swallowed up and offended. And I remember he, the last conversation I was having with him, I was having it with him and one of his three friends that he meets with that he says, I'm with these friends and these friends are the ones that are in the truth. And the very first thing the person walks in the door says, we want to know right off the, right off the, from the beginning. Let's not, let's completely... Let's get right down to to exactly what I want to ask you. Ty, do you obey this commandment? Yes or no? And I responded and I said, I'm very disappointed that this is the very first thing that came out of your, that, that the first thing you messaged me. And you know what their message was to me? Because they said, do you obey? Do you keep the Sabbath? And the Lord told me to respond to them and say to them, I'm very disappointed that this is the first thing. And why? 
Because love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You can, you can observe the Sabbath and deal treacherously with the wife of your youth. You want to ask me about the first commandment, but you have another strange God with you, which is the first commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You should have been thinking about the first one, but you were thinking about the fourth one. I'm not saying the fourth one's not important. I'm saying, why did you make it about the fourth one and you've left off the first one? And you know what they said to that response? I said, I'm very disappointed to hear you say that. And they said, that's how we know you're false. And that's how the conversation ended. But they didn't hear me say yes or no about the Sabbath. They didn't hear the matter. but they didn't want to apply it to their heart. They didn't want to hear. Instead, they were wise in their own conceit and they said, we already know, we already know this, remember. And I'm saying, well, are you, are you reading your Bible every day? Well, no, I'm not doing that. Well, how can we, uh, how can we, possibly, how can we possibly talk about the Sabbath when you, when you don't read the Bible every day? Well, I just, my job. Well, the Bible says that in order to enter the Lord's Sabbath, you'd have to cease from your own works. So you observe the Sabbath on Saturday, but you haven't actually observed the Sabbath once. You have to understand how the Lord wants us to be married to him. How the Lord wants us to be married unto him. It says, if you cry after knowledge, if you lift a voice up for understanding, if you seek her as silver, if you search for her as for hid treasures, then you shall understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. Out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He lays up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler. He's a buckler. That word buckler is, just think of it like a, it's a shield, but it's a, it's a tight, hold fast shield that you're not going to move anywhere. He keeps the paths of what? Judgment. When you stand in the path of judgment, the Lord keeps you there. There's keeping power of the Lord when you actually Love judgment. He preserves the way of his saints. Then you shall understand righteousness and judgment and equity. Yea, every good path. When you're seeking God's word, when you're saying, this is the wife of my youth, this is the first love that Jesus gave me, I'm not going to let go of this. When you love God, and you don't lightly esteem his word and the rock of your salvation. It says, when wisdom enters into your heart and knowledge is pleasant to thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee. Understanding shall what? Keep thee. To deliver you from the way of the evil man. To deliver you from the way of the evil man. From the man that speaks froward things. Who leave the paths of uprightness. You see this? The treacherous dealers, they leave the paths of, an, of uprightness. They were once on it, but they leave it. The people at the sand. The, 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 those who are, were speaking at the sin, they may have started on the path of uprightness, but they've left that because they did not esteem the Lord the way they should have. So he's saying, where is the holiness of God? You listened to the froward men because you weren't, you weren't hearkening. 
These men leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of what? Darkness. Who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked. It's part of them delighting in all kinds of strange ideas, including Disney. There's so many things that are happening. These people are saying, this is virtuous, this is virtuous. And in this video series, that's what we're going to be doing, is showing you exactly how they profane it. They're standing up for some things. They're, 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 they've got their, their bullhorns. They're, 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 they're saying something. The problem is that it's profaned. If you actually look at it in a biblical way, you say, how is this even possible? And that's what we plan to show you. It says, whose ways are crooked and they froward in their paths. To deliver thee from who? The strange woman, even from the stranger, which flatters with her word, with her words. What else does she do? Which forsakes the guide of her, what? Youth. That's what she does. That's what she does. And forgets what? The covenant of her God. That's what she does. She deals treacherously. She teaches you to deal treacherously, to profane holiness, to not be completely set apart. And she teaches you to profane that covenant. Forget it. That's how you entertain evil men. That's why there's people that are on the stage at the send sharing, sharing platforms with people that they have no idea what doctrine they believe. And they're just doing it because they're saying, well, I mean, this is an event and I'll get paid. And they have no idea what they're actually doing. That they're dealing treacherously. They don't know that they're heaping up for themselves judgment. They don't know. That's why it says the way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. They don't even know that what they're doing is against God. God hates the putting away and they've put God away out of the event, but they're crying. God, bring the generation back. The Lord says, I'm not coming to that. I'm not coming to that event. Verse 18, for her house inclines unto what? Death. Death and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again. Neither take they hold of the paths of life. That thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep good, keep the paths of what? Righteousness for the upright. Listen to this. This is one of the most important verses of this message. For the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it. It's one thing to dwell in the land. It's another thing to remain in it. Do you understand? The upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be exactly what the Lord said in Malachi. The Lord will cut off the man that does this. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the who? Transgressors shall be what? Rooted out. Does that mean they weren't planted there to begin with? No, they were planted there to begin with. That's why they're being rooted out. This strange transaction comes for trees. This transaction comes for trees, not for just false apostles. This transaction comes for trees to root them out of the garden of the Lord. That's the objective. The adulteress hunts for what? The precious life. She's not going to hunt for something that's not precious. These people 
have deceivers over them that are deceiving them. Some of them are preaching from the stage as deceivers, and some of them are preaching from the stage as being deceived. They're walking in the paths of darkness, not knowing that they're stumbling, not knowing that they're not pleasing to God. Yet they want to read a few scriptures, spend a little bit of time with God. And I remember specifically my wife just reminding me of someone who went to the, who's someone who was speaking at the sand is actually Rick Pino. And how he actually says in front of the camera one day, he says, you know, when I got married, I just had to realize that my time with the Lord couldn't be the same. That's what he said. It wasn't the same. And now I have ministry and now I have these things and I just had to realize I've just got to do what I can. So now like I'm on my way to the airport, I read a little. Maybe I'll do something. Is it just do what you can? Is that what the Lord paid for? Do what you can? Do you see Why? Do you see the error? Do you see why you're not too far from that if you don't take heed to your spirit? Do you see why when you get mighty, you have a thought, maybe I can just move this around. Something cannot be left off. Do not put away the wife of your youth because if you do, you are forsaking your husband. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians. I've got two short, shorter passages to go through so that you can understand what Paul was really saying. And then we can talk about what the Lord really desires from you. We know what to be afraid of. We know what to be scared of. Is the, we, we, we are not, we are, it says, for the fear where which he feared me. We're not to be afraid of anything except for the Lord. It's the Lord. We fear him. Let him be your fear, the Bible says. Let him be your dread. Lord, I'm, I don't want to be against you. I want to be for you, Lord. I'm going to take heed to myself. I'm going to examine myself to see whether I be in the faith. And Paul writes this. He says in verse, verse one, would to God that you would bear with me a little in my folly. Indeed, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you unto what? One husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He says, but I fear lest by any means, say any means, see any means, her ways are movable. She try everything she can, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his Subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if, an, if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Paul is saying, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy because I've espoused you to one husband. I want you to get married to one husband. So you need to be one wife. But if somebody comes to you, I'm, I'm afraid that if someone comes to you and he's preaching something else different, if someone comes to you lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You cannot, you cannot have God without his benefits. You cannot. If you please God, your, your, the, your battles will be like, there's like, no, like you're doing effort, but there's hardly any effort. 
If you please God, it says, more were killed by the fire that fell from heaven that day than the sword. So more work than you can do when you are pleasing to God, when you're in the right place and you go forward to do your job or to do whatever the Lord has told you to do. And you're like, ah, and you think like, wow, I just won that battle. You don't even realize the Lord's been there. Ooh, he's been smiting for you. He's saying, my power is greater than yours. I give you the power to get wealth. I give you the power to hold all things together. I will help your life stay intact. I will keep your children. I will keep your marriage. I will keep everything in your life. Don't be beguiled by the enemy trying to tell you that you've got to embrace another or that you've got to please another. If you please God, he will deliver you from every single one of those things that try to come against you. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. All those that rise up against you shall fall. There's nothing. You can't know God and not receive his benefits. You can't stand at the right hand of God and not receive pleasures forevermore. You can't be his friend and him not open up doors that no man can open and shut doors that no man can close. You cannot know the living God and be his friend and these things. Jesus is saying, don't take thought of your life. Why is he saying that? He's saying, because if you seek First, the kingdom of God. If you just keep me, my law is the apple of your eye. If you keep me as your love, if you don't forsake your first love and you just keep judgment and love and don't let anything get in the way of that and take heed to your spirit, then you're always with me. If you take heed to that, all these other things, I will be with you and you will put one hand to something and it will be as if 10 hands went on something. There's a situation that Tyler and I are in right now. And it's exactly what's happening. We're, we're, just, we're, we're, we're putting one hand towards something and it's, and it's just happening. And we're saying, Lord, thank you. Like, thank you. But there's this admonishment upon us to say, this is not the thing. Don't turn this into the thing. This is, this is over there. Lord, our time with you. There have been times where this thing could try to come in and steal from that time. And Tyler and I, we've been trying, we've been keeping it to say, this has to be, let's keep it. Just, just this week again, we're saying there's something happened. Something happened to some of the, so, some, something happened in the minds where all of a sudden we, we got something new to do and we left off some other things. That's not what the Lord is saying. The Lord's saying, don't leave those things off. Put those things back. So we're making corrections. We're constantly saying, nope. That's not going to happen. We're not going to deal treacherously in this way. We're not going to. Sometimes something tries to come into your life to invade your life, to try to cause you to deal treacherously with the Lord. You have to start cutting thorns at that very moment and saying, nope, not going to happen. Lord, if, if you gave this to me, you're going to, you're going to help me to, to appropriate this. If you put this good work in front of me, then you're going to give me the ability to actually execute it without me turning this into something else or without me trying to rush my time with you or without me trying to actually move in another direction. Lord, I've got to keep these first things. Do the first works, the judgment of God, the love of God, hating evil, getting away from all these things and coming back to those principal things and saying, I will serve the Lord and I will not serve a strange God. I will adopt no strange idea. I don't know a strange saying. When I hear it, I, I'm cautious. When I hear someone say, oh, you know how it is. I'm like, that's not how it is. I've had people say, you know how it is. And I, 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 don't, I don't even respond. I, that's not how it is. That's how it is for you. That, that's the breakfast your wife makes you in the morning. But the wife of my youth doesn't make me that. She makes me food convenient for me. I have to realize you are, you are peculiar people. You have to realize you are peculiar. You have got to stand in a different place. You've got to believe that God is for you. You've got to believe that you have something different. You've got to perceive that your merchandise is good. 
You've got to be that virtuous woman. And that brings us to our last scripture here. I'm sorry, forgive me. There's, there's two verses. And then, and then a, a final verse in Isaiah. But this is Proverbs 31. It's hard to find a woman. It's hard to find a good wife. It says here in verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. (laughs) She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. There's a context to Isaiah chapter 62, but I just want to read verse five. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. I don't know about you, but when God rejoices, okay, just think about that. You make the heart of the Lord so glad that he rejoices. You're telling me something's not going to happen? The Bible says all of the works of the Lord are wonderful, are wondrous. There's not one thing that God can do that's not mighty and strong. If the Lord rejoices, (laughs) if the Lord gets up and desires to to dance or desire, he's just he's happy, he wants to sing, he wants to, he wants to bless. You don't think something is going to happen to the man who causes his father, his hus- her, her husband, the woman who causes her husband to rejoice? And this all started in my heart last night as I began to sing this song to the Lord, I'm going to sing it in a moment, but I began to sing this song on one of those later nights. Saying, Lord, you're the wife of my youth. Your commandments are the, the, the wife of my youth. I, I want to seek you. I'm going to be with you. You're the wife of my youth. And then, and then right in the same song, I want to be your bride. So wait, hold on. Do I have, are you my wife or, or, or I'm your bride? Which, which one is this? And the Lord's saying, if you will tend to the wife of your youth, you will be my bride. See, these are shadows in the scriptures that the Bible says there's no male nor female. These are shadows in the scriptures of how we relate to God. If we will deal with, well with God's word and with the love of God and with judgment and with all the things that God does, if we will deal well with those things and not profane them and not profane the holiness of God or the covenant of our fathers, if we will do well with those things to keep those things in place, then the Lord will rejoice over you as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. The Lord will rejoice that you can do the Lord good every day. Not some days, not when you're feeling in the spirit. That's not what a wife does. Think about those of you who are married. You don't wake up and not be a husband for a day. You don't wake up and not be a wife. You don't wake up and not do something for the one you love. (laughs) You... You have to be faithful. 
It's the expectation of even every man, how much more your God. The Lord is faithful. He will not deny himself. The question is, who is this dove? Who is this dove that's going to consider the Lord so wonderful? Not put away the commandments of the Lord, but hear everything to, 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 to say, if it's my husband, I want to hear it. If it's judgment, I want to hear it. If it's love, I want to hear it. If I have to hate something, I will hate something. If I have to... And get rid of the stoutness of what you've once known and start coming into the gentleness of knowing your beloved. If you know the Lord, you will love Him. And if you love the Lord, you'll obey Him. And you will find pleasure in their doing. You will. You'll say, this is very good. If your mind is contrary to that, if your mind is contrary to that, that is your spirit. That is your spirit, the stoutness of your spirit saying, but I don't have time, but you have a reason why. You have a reason why you don't want to be with him. The simplicity of Christ is that he wants to live with you every day. He wants to be with you every day. He doesn't want a situation to change how close you are with him. He doesn't want a happening, a sudden surprise or, or sudden uh, something that happens to all of a sudden be the thing that causes you to, to doubt him. He wants you to say, I woke up yesterday and I sought the Lord. I wake up today and I seek the Lord. I meditate on the, word, on the word of the Lord day and night. He keeps in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. I want to be with him. I want to be with him. This is what it means to dwell with the Lord. That you always remain separate. That you always remain holy as your heavenly father is holy. I pray that this word has caused you to have an understanding of why people and mighty men have fallen before you. And in what, in little foxes, in the little transactions, the little things that cause you to just leave off. This man may have been revealed to the Lord of, of what he should be doing on, on, on a certain day of the week, on a Sabbath. The Bible says, that can happen. Am I despising that? No, but here's what I'm saying is, if you, if you have come to those truths, but you leave off the, one, the very one thing that caused you to know those things in the first place was you loving God's word. Loving God and, and actually cutting out things that get in the way of that. That's what I'm trying to communicate today to you so that you would love the wife of your youth and return and do those first works. And so the Lord would rejoice over you. That you wouldn't find yourself inadvertently hating your husband. That you would not deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. Let's pray together. Father. 
as children, Lord. We ask you, Lord, that if there's anything that is in the way of us seeing the truth as a child, that you would help us, Lord, to take heed to our spirits today. Oh, Lord. We are poor and needy people. We have nothing but you, Lord. How hard is to bring you delight, to bring you joy, to bring you gladness. Oh, Lord, to love you and to really know what the love of God is. That we would not profane the holiness of God. And that we would not deal treacherously by profaning the covenant of our fathers. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would change and transform our minds. This whole generation, Lord, change and transform the minds of those who will hear your voice now. I pray, Lord, that we would be holy as you are holy, Lord. I pray that we'd be spiritually minded and have this mind the same that was in Christ Jesus. I pray, Lord, that we would know your way, know your truth, and keep your commandments and live. Father, I pray, Lord, if there's any areas in our lives where we've dealt treacherously against you, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict us, Lord. And Lord, I pray that those who have already started to sear their conscience with a hot iron by putting away the Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray that they would rip that that searing off, Lord, as a new flesh. I pray that they would do everything that they can to cry before you, Lord, to say, Lord, everything that I need to do, help me to put salve on my eyes so I can fix this, Lord, so I can fix this. That I don't deal treacherously against the wife of my youth. That I go back and I remember these first works. And I remember the principal things. I remember these things, Lord, that I would not. That even though I'm trying to keep these other things, Lord, that I would not forget about judgment. That I would not forget about how to love you, Lord. How to put you first. And how to understand that you are the one that brings increase. That you are the one that helps that you are the one that heals, that you are the one that binds, that you are the one that builds, that you give and you take away. I pray that your people would understand. And I pray, Lord, for amending to take place now. As your word says, amend your doings. That people would be starting now to amend things, Lord. Change the way they do things. Change their priorities. Change the things they put themselves through daily. Change the way that their mind is set. Change the things around them. I pray by your Holy Spirit, convict them, Lord, that they would not be given to the change of this land, to the change of this time, to the change of their jobs, to the change of their lives, to the change of their houses and cars, to the change of the things that are given to them, to the change of the relationships around them, to the change of their children. That they would keep the holiness of the Lord in place. to keep your way, every good path, Lord, every good path.
are my first love. You are my first love. I'll have no one but you. You're the wife of my youth. You are my first love. You are my first love. I'll have no one but you. You are the wife of my youth. You are my first love. You are my first love. I have no one but you. You're the wife of my youth. You are the God of my youth. You are my first love. You are my first love. I'll have no one but you. You're the wife of my youth. Oh, let me be yours, Lord. Oh, let me be yours, Lord. 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 You are my first love. You are my first love. I'll have no one but you. The life of my youth. You are the wife of my youth. Oh Lord, you're my first love. You are my first love. I'll have no one but you. You're the wife of my youth. You're the wife of my youth. You're the wife of my youth. Oh Lord, say, let me be yours, Lord. Let me be yours, Lord. Let me be yours, Lord. Let me be. Forever more. Whoa, 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 we 
me be yours alone Let 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 me be your bride. Let me be your bride. Let me be your bride. Let me do you good all of the days of my life. Let me be your bride. Let me be your bride. Oh Lord. Let me be your bride. Let me do you good all of the days of my life. priests are coming, the ministers before the altar, cleanse us, Lord, cleanse your people, Yes. make us one, that the world may know. The true Jesus. Yes. Perfect. 
blood cast out all fear. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Father. to repent for this as well. This week the Lord is telling me to return to my first love, to do the first works. He was saying that earlier. I do repent. There, there has not been the diligence needed and the level of violence to actually spend time with Him in the morning and have that, that quiet time, that that time with the Lord. And I, it was, it's been rushed. And in, in rushing those times, I found myself beholding strange things, beholding strange wives. I want to repent to you all for that. 
into the Lord. And that, that needs to change now. spirit and not knowing why. And it's even translated in how I eat with my wife. I repent of doing treacherously with the wife of my youth. Not spending that time needed. Waiting for one day truly is an entering into his death. I say this with fear and trembling. I hear the voice of the Lord saying, align yourself, my people. For how can you walk the straight, narrow path if there are unjust weights? Align yourself. to repent for getting into those young men and being afraid to bring judgment or being judged.
Thank you. 